So in the end, you will ask for questions. Okay. No, not like a, not like a conference. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the second lecture of the day is uh, Ellen Linden Strauss, uh, some product, some product phenomenon and random walks. Thank you. I hope this is turned on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in this beautiful city in front of this uh, young and uh, inspiring audience. So, uh, like in uh, Professor Lova's talk, uh, in my talk, too, there will be some interaction between discrete structure of some graph and the continuous structure, so the interaction would be uh, have a different flavor. So my graph, the graph I'm going to take, is a finite graph. The vertex set is just going to be the integers mod p, or even better, the non-zero integers mod p. And then I need to define an edge set. So my edge set, I would connect uh, every vertex n to bn modulo p. <coughs> so n is any invertible element of z mod p. And b is any element in some set b. So this is a graph. It could be interesting, it could be uninteresting. Um, so one case where it's uninteresting, perhaps B, for example. I could take B to be a subgroup of the multiplicative group. In this case, as a graph, this is not a particularly interesting graph. It's a disjoint union of uh, complete graphs. Um, but still, the result I'm going to present is going to be interesting in this case. Um, the size of the set B, I want it to be not too small, so I want it to be bigger than some polynomial in the number of vertices. Um, now there's a natural embedding into a continuous space, so there's a natural embedding. Of Z uh, mod P star, I can take into a uh, unit interval, which I think of as the real numbers divided by the integers, by taking N into N over P. So this is a uh, discrete, the image of Z modulo P star of all of the vertices of my graph is a discrete uh, subset of this unit interval. But as P becomes larger and larger, uh, this uh, becomes finer and finer. Now, once you have a graph, you could take the random walk on the graph, just a simple random walk. Well, um, so this is for me, uh, B is not necessarily closed as the inverse, so this is a directed graph. Okay, this is a directed graph. For all it's worth, I can take the random walk. Um, by starting from a point, then uh, applying a random element of B, then applying another random, ent random element of B. And the main theorem I want to present, let me just add one more notation. So let's, whether for any set not necessarily called B, I will let new B be the uniform measure on the set. Uh, 
and I will let uh, if I have two measures on uh, Z modulo P star with mu mu or uh, measures on Z modulo P star I would let the uh, multiplicative convolution to be where the multiplicative convolution Okay. So the theorem I would like to present, which is highly, which is a beautiful and uh, deep theorem by uh, Bourguin, Glibichuk, and Konyagen. Possibly this. Uh, this possibly might be a bit more general than the version in the original Bourguin Gubichuk Gunyagin paper. It says that for every delta, delta remember is this parameter actually I want to call it. I have other uses for delta. So maybe let's call it alpha. So for every alpha, there will be some epsilon greater than zero, an integer k, such that if I look at the Fourier transform of the k-fold, a multiplicative convolution of uh, of uh, new, so of course, if c is zero, this is just going to be one. But I am taking c non-zero. So this is um, going to be bounded by some absolute constant um, p to the minus epsilon. So just by going finitely many, a bounded number of steps depending only on alpha in my random walk, I'm already very well distributed in uh, in uh, in my circle. So let me maybe just state this is just a uh, superficial uh, restatement of the theorem, but maybe it would convey more intuitive content. This is a Fourier transform. Um, so a corollary would be that if I have a function which is, let's say, a differentiable function on the unit interval, then if I take x1 up to xk, these are iid, uniform in b, uniform in b, right, so these are random variables, each one is, has some value, sorry, has some value in B, and uh, these values are uh, equally probable. Then I can look at the conditional expectation of F evaluated at x, k, x1, a over P for some integer, non-zero integer, A. This is what I mean by taking K steps in the random walk. This is a conditional expectation. I subtract the average of F in our mod Z. Then this would be less than some constant. Um, L2 norm of the derivative of F times p to the minus epsilon. 
Okay, this is an easy corollary of this uh, estimate of Fourier coefficients, but this maybe has more uh, intuitive com content. Maybe I should add, right, what I mean by, so here what is the Fourier transform? If mu is the measure, then of course mu hat of C, you could debate whether you should take a sign plus or minus. Uh, doesn't really matter to me. And take the sum of A in Z modulo P star. And of course, um, I use a notation EX is E to the 2 pi IX. So now hopefully everything on the board is uh, well defined. Hmm? So this is for every A um, in Z modulo P. So uniformly on whichever starting point you choose, you do this random random walk okay K times, you get a uniform distribution. Um, how do you prove something like that? That's not easy. I have to hide this now? No. Um, but let's start with easy observations. So here are some easy observations. So, the first easy observation, so maybe we use any probability measure. Let's suppose that if I take this uh, multiplicative convolution of mu by some, uh, by my uh, uniform measure on B nu B, I take the Fourier curve transform and suppose that this is for some bigger than delta, for some C naught in Z modulo P star. So, I guess what is this by definition? This is just the sum 1 over B, the sum of mu hat of B, C, not. This is what this uh, convolution, the Fourier transform of the convolution is, if you walk uh, through it. So this is bigger than delta. So now there's an average which is bigger than delta. So there should be at least Um, maybe B over uh, 2 delta um, maybe um, delta B over 2 C's such that U hat of uh, C is bigger than delta over 2. But otherwise, all of those coefficients for which mu hat is less than delta over 2 can contribute at most delta over 2. The rest will somehow contribute something. Um, so that's one observation. Another observation, equally trivial, If I take again, uh, let's look at the number of, uh, let's maybe give another notation because I'm going to talk at the full, uh, large Fourier coefficients of a measure quite a bit. So. 
for any measure mu uh, on z modulo p star and any uh, delta bigger than zero. I'm going to let this be the Fourier coefficient, the Fourier coefficient so c and uh, z modulo p star such that the Fourier coefficient of mu at C is uh, bigger than this. So another observation is that uh, if I have, if I take this kind of uh, convolution, this cannot have too many, cannot have uh, too many very large Fourier coefficients. Simply because of uh, possible inequality. Um, sorry. Here it's not mu, but uh, mu convolved with this uh, new b. Simply because if I look at uh, the size of the set, multiplied by delta square. This is a lower bound to the L2 norm of the Fourier coefficient of the Fourier transform article. Each big Fourier coefficient contributes at least Delta square to the sum, this makes sense. But this is uh, essentially the same as uh, um, L2 norm of this measure, where it's because of my normalization of the factor of P coping in. And now, I earlier I thought of this measure as somehow copies of mu uh, averaged after I multiply the elements of b. Now I can think of this as copies of mu b shifted by mu. So by uh, convexity, um, I have um, the bound of p over b. So you can't have too many big Fourier coefficients, you can't have too few big Fourier coefficients. So in particular, hmm? nothing, it's a probability measure. My measures are always probability measures. What? Hmm? No, it cannot have too many. It has to be smooth, right? So if I smooth by everything, convolution is not an in. So, this already shows that if my set B is not just, uh, where did I have, if my set B is not just bigger than P to the alpha, but is in fact bigger than P to the half, we get something interesting. Because uh, I can apply uh, applying uh, the first observation um, with uh, mu equals mu b. I see that if uh, for some C, the Fourier transform of the convolution some non-trivial C is bigger than delta, then um, mu B should have many uh, Fourier coefficients bigger than half, should be bigger than um, 
be built over two. On the other hand, uh, so I compare this and that, I get, uh, on the other hand, I know that the number of Fourier coefficients, on the other hand, just by taking mu the trivial measure, I know that this size of this same set is at most, um, what do I have here, something like uh, 4 over delta squared um, P over the size of B. So I want these to be consistent. The only way this would be consistent, to make them consistent, uh, I must have the delta should be uh, bigger, should be smaller, sorry, than um, something like P over the size of B squared to the power one third. So, just these two observations that uh, such a here applied to the twofold convolution, you basically see that uh, you have one argument giving that you have um, you should have many big Fourier coefficients, another argument showing that you should have few Fourier coefficients, and if uh, my set I'm averaging on is large, this is already collide. Now, of course, if my set B is of size uh, P to the 100, there's a lot of room between what this uh, trivial, uh, what these two trivial bounds give, and somehow the strategy would be you could choose actually either one of them. The strategy would be to try to get um, maybe by applying a higher convolution power to try to get, if you know that there's one big Fourier coefficient getting not just roughly the size of B big Fourier coefficients, but much more big Fourier coefficients. So the key lemma, which basically finishes off the proof of this, uh, of this uh, random walk result, is the following uh, import the following lemma. Once this lemma is established, everything is uh, we're basically uh, in good shape. Here's the main lemma. For every alpha, there is some epsilon such that if I have a set which is bigger than P to the alpha and delta which is not too small. But the important thing is that epsilon is an absolute constant that depends only on alpha, it doesn't depend on p in any way. Um, and view any probability measure on um, z mod p, then if I look at the number of big Fourier coefficients for mu, and I sort of sacrifice, I do two sacrifices here. One of them is that I'm going, so I'm comparing the number of big Fourier coefficients for uh, mu, which big now meaning more than essentially delta squared. And if a fair constant factor you could safely ignore. This would be bigger than, okay, possibly there's some constant here just to be safe but this concept is absolute. The number of big Fourier coefficients of this smooth measure of mu um, 
Delta. Delta. So basically, this means this expression. This basically means that if I take uh, if I have many big Fourier coefficients for the smooth measure of uh, mu, which tends to have, this is some kind of average of mu, right? this measure is some average, this is some, this is exactly by definition, right? It's, um, averaged of, uh, versions of mu which are multiplied by integers. So it's some kind of smooth measure version of mu, which would have smaller Fourier coefficients. If this has some big Fourier coefficient, then my original measure had lots more. But somehow, just for safety, I need to give a more linear definition what a big Fourier coefficient means. That's the main lemma. Once you have this main lemma, you start with that easy observation or maybe, yeah, you start with this easy observation. If you have one Fourier coefficient for a high convolution power of mu b, then you have roughly b big Fourier coefficients. If you take a convolution power with one less element, then you get essentially p to the epsilon times the size of b if you go, uh, let me write this down. If I have some, or some large convolution power, then bigger than some delta, then I should have, for the next convolution power, um, The number of big Fourier coefficients bigger than actually delta, right? We know is uh, more than something like the size of b. Now you apply this uh, main lemma. You take one less uh, at the side of the convolution. Maybe you take your delta squared or delta squared over four, whatever you, you should you want. Uh, this would be now bigger than b to the one minus uh, epsilon p to the epsilon. Next step, you get, uh, and then eventually you get that. Uh, Um, new B, it had lots of big Fourier coefficients. Then some two to the k, maybe with some constant. Oops. Right, I'm looking at uh, so the number of Fourier coefficients, which are big for the k for k minus one for convolution power, eventually I get that the number of big Fourier coefficients for my original measure was absurdly high, was uh, basically something like uh, some constant p to the one minus one minus epsilon to the k or something. Okay eventually wouldn't make sense.
Um, it's not uh, really used, um, but certainly in what I said so far, uh, nothing has been used here. Well, some, so, so far what I said was sort of smooth. So, this lemma is where the combinatorics come in, right? This is the heart of the map. It's certainly, you could give a f version, you need to make some kind of assumption about new B, which would not be, but it's basically a statement about probability, maybe. It's not a statement about that. Um, it's a good question. I would uh, probably some assumption about the L2 norm of, of new would be not that probably what you what you use. Here. Um, yeah, you could sort of. It's already somehow not so important anymore. You have it with some tiny power. I was generous with you. I, uh, so then how do you prove this uh, main lemma that somehow the key... Um, so inside the proof of the main lemma there are sort of two ingredients. One is some kind of sum product fact. And relatively simple, so those various ways of expressing the fact that in the ring of the integers modulo p, um, it's hard to get a set which is simultaneously stable under addition and under multiplication. So there are very various uh, expressions, some easier, some hard. What I need is actually something very, very simple. So you could think of it, so I understand the problem session, you could try to come up with a proof of this. This is um, maybe, it's closely related, though easier, than the sum uh, product theorems as in uh, bourguin katz tau and of course, uh, there is no formal relation. Everyone immediately somehow thinks of uh, Erdos Semeredi, who proved uh, some similar something uh, of this nature in uh, the integers. But what I need is something very simple, that for every um, alpha, you could find two integers k and l, and I mean, if you really want, you could take them to be the same. So that if you have, for any set in uh, z modulo p star, um, with at least p to the alpha elements, if you take a uh, k-fold sum of um, l-fold product of the set B, you get everything. So I need to introduce that. So this is sigma k of the set A for me is A1 plus plus AK, A in A and I leave it to your imagination what this L-fold product is. Okay, that's sort of a combinatorial fact, which is uh, relatively easy in implicit retrospect, maybe not uh, immediately. Then, um, now, but, okay, in and of itself, this does not seem, how you don't see how to use it to make use of it. Um, there's two more uh, simple things that are needed. One of them is the Ruja triangle inequality. 
which is a somehow in terms of price performance the amount of mileage you could get from this compared to the difficulty of proof this might set a record whenever I have two three subsets of a group G not necessarily commutative so G is now not a graph but a group I can look at the product set I can look at the product set of A and uh, B and I can bound it in terms of the product set of AC and C inverse B divided by the size of C this is almost stupid because whenever I have uh, a, B here, right, I can present it in uh, at, at least C ways in uh, A, C, um, C inverse P. So I have, right, so this is really a uh, stupid inequality, but it's a very useful one. And one other ingredient, um, which is basically just Cauchy Schwartz, you could also uh, try to do in the problem session. For every three subsets of uh, Z modulo P, Um, you could find an element in C such that the size of A plus CB should be um, at least half minimum between the size of AB and uh, the size of C. So you could try to think about trying to use this to prove some statement of this type, right? So you basically could try to see if I can get A, B, C being exactly the same size, and you see that you just don't get anything. Once, if C was a bit larger, you'd get something. But uh, this basically tells you that if I have a set of directions which is bigger than the, pro the size of my the product the size of A and B, then I sort of suddenly get uh, more points in this uh, sum set. And um, combining combining this, all of these things together, you have the following nice statement. Here's a corollary. Um, for every alpha, there is an epsilon such that if I have two sets, A, which is let's say bigger than B, which is at least uh, p to the alpha there is some epsilon sorry, sorry, some b in b such that um, a plus b a is bigger than uh, maybe half a to the one minus epsilon so, what's the point here? Um, so I guess the interesting case is when A is larger than B. So immediately this gives you absolutely nothing, this sort of cauchy schwarz type argument. But then I would replace B, oh dear, replace B by a large uh, some set 
corrected. Um, yeah, you could maybe even take it to be the whole thing. Maybe you don't have to go all the way, but replace B by some large subset. Then you apply this Cauchy Schwartz step argument, and you get some C, which you could write as B1 times B, whatever, 100 plus B101 times. B uh, 200, some kind of expression, let's say B 900 times B 901, so up to B 1000, some kind of expression uh, such that A plus CA is basically uh, Um, minimum between uh, the size of P and uh, A squared. And now you could each time um, by applying this uh, Ruja inequality, you could each time. So let's take the simplest case. Maybe I had. Uh, let me show you what I would do. If I had, for instance, C, is just a product of two things. And of course, in general case, you need to apply some kind of induction. So suppose I had C equals B1 plus B2. So then I want, I know that this is a large set. This is large, this is large. Well, I know that it is, uh, at most, a plus B1A by this uh, Rouge inequality. Um, maybe I take min minus just to. There's a version, the pluses and minuses are somehow negotiable in this uh, triangle inequality. But um, B1A plus B1, B2A, over the size of B1A. So this is my C, this is somehow my A, and this is my B in the Rouge triangle inequality. So um, this is just the size of A, and so I have, and this is basically, let's say, this is basically, this is the minimum between P and size of A squared, so I get that uh, either for i equals 1 or i equals 2, a plus bi is bigger than uh, minimum between p, a squared over the size of a to the half, which is um, an expression of, what, uh, of the kind I want. And okay, the general case goes similarly. So, the second ingredient, which I don't have time to get to today, I guess. Oh, how much time? Actually, I started at four. No, I still have some time. Okay, so. Now, if somebody gives me some set A, um, I mean, this corollary here is sort of a bit strange. Um, sorry. It's sort of a bit strange because somebody gives me a set A, I can then try to choose a set B uh, any way I want. So, in fact, this corollary, you could just say it as follows. This corollary actually implies, is equivalent to something which is seemingly uh, stronger. If I look at the number of uh, C in Z mod P star, 
such that A plus C uh, A is less than half A to the 1 minus epsilon P to the epsilon the number of these is at most uh, P to the alpha Okay, there are very few exceptions, very few C's which do not you can think of this as a projection from uh, F Z modulo P times Z modulo P to Z modulo P there are very few directions in which this projection is not substantially bigger than A that is what this uh, that is one crucial ingredient in the proof of the main lemma. Now I'm slightly short of time, not terribly short of time. I won't tell you what my second main ingredient is. I'll keep it as a surprise later, but there's another ingredient that is needed, which goes under the name of Balog uh, Semiradi Gower lemma, which is uh, would keep, appear in a crucial role. So, I have, right, I, I'm trying to prove this theorem, and somehow, without thinking too much, it's clear that multiplication plays a role here, because you see multiplication, I have big Fourier coefficients for, uh, if, uh, if the set, essentially even for the same delta, the set of big Fourier coefficients for this uh, convolved for mu is roughly the same as a set of big Fourier coefficients for mu b convolved with mu uh, uh, and then I take a uh, multiply it by the set b. So multiplication somehow appears um, uh, appears in a natural way. So somehow multiplicative structure Appears here in a natural way. But where does the additive structure come from? I mean, somehow, at least in the title, it had some product I, in this uh, in this uh, right. Somehow, in this type of expression, I have also a sum. Somehow there should be some additive structure, which is not evident where it comes from. So the additive structure is related to the question Gil asked me earlier. It's not so easy if I give you a Fourier transform for you to know whether it's a Fourier transform of a measure. Even in classical harmonical analysis, there's this Bochner theorem, right, which tells you that the Fourier transform of a measure, sort of anything only if classification, the Fourier transform of a, me of a measure is exactly a sequence which is positive definite. You work through what does it mean for a sequence to be positive definite with the definition. It's equivalent to being the Fourier transform of a probability measure. You don't get much. Um, but there is somehow, so, Somehow the additive structure comes from the fact that we are talking about we're talking about Fourier transform about of measures Fourier transform of measures. So this is not an if and only if condition, but it's a useful one. Which uh, and again, it's just some kind of cauchy schwarz so suppose I have a probability measure, and this works in any context, but let's take a probability measure or in the context that I'm looking at. Actually, I could take it on Z modulo P. Um, so for any uh, set A inside Z modulo P, I can look at the Suppose A is a set where the Fourier coefficient is large, maybe even large in the same uh, quadrant of the complex plane. So 
So this average should be large. Well, it turns out that it's always bounded by um, you don't even have to put absolute values here. This is a general uh, statement about Fourier transformer measures, which is again an application of Cauchy Schwarz. So, again, maybe I will leave this as an exercise for the problem session. But even though in this uh, statement uh, the additive part doesn't seem to appear, it sort of exists because of this line that I have a probability measure. And therefore, if I convolve it with new, with new B, which is also a probability measure, I get another probability measure. So, I guess now, to prove this main lemma, let me consider three different sets. E0, E1, E2. E0 is a set of uh, big Fourier coefficient for uh, the convolved measure. E2 is a set of Fourier coefficients which are big in a slightly uh, weaker sense. And E1 is some kind of intermediate between them, which would help me negotiate some good agreement between these two sets of Fourier coefficients. It sort of has the quality of approximation of the second one, but the measure of the first one. I think for my purposes it's better to have here a slightly different concept. So I have these three different uh, three different uh, now because somehow I get this measure by averaging it's quite obvious that um, first of all it's completely obvious once delta is smaller than one that they have more Fourier coefficients here than here. So E0 is less than the number of Fourier coefficients E1. And it's also quite easy to see that uh, E2 couldn't have, uh, uh, that E2 should basically have more four big Fourier coefficients, should be bigger than E1. Maybe I need to add here some constant, and maybe I need to add here some power of delta, just uh, for the fun of it. So, but basically, I have this kind of condition between these uh, Fourier coefficients. So somehow, if I don't get a lot, a large gain, so if. Uh, is not large the ratio between the size of E1 and E0 is not large ok so let's try to figure out what this says so we have this inequality let's try to use now this inequality for um, this uh, convolved measure so maybe we'll give it a name let's say u1 is this new b And maybe I'll choose instead of uh, E0, I'll choose a positive fraction of the coefficients which are not only big but big in some fixed direction. So I have here 
some E0 prime, which is essentially, you could think of as E0, but as maybe one sixth of E0. I'm fixing all the Fourier coefficients, which, so that uh, mu hat is in some uh, one, uh, quadrant of space, or one sixth of the space, or something to ensure that there will be no cancellation when I add the Fourier coefficient. U1. See, this will be bigger than uh, delta over 2. So if I square it, this is maybe delta squared over 4 or something. Where this is at most to some. 1 over summation and e 0 prime squared c prime well now this is some of these some of these differences would be inside my set E1, some would not be inside E1. But those inside E1, those which are not in E1, the Fourier coefficients, I don't know, maybe I could feel 8 and 64, I'm not, uh, not going to be greedy. So those inside for C and C prime, for which C minus C prime are inside, are not inside E1, contribute at most delta squared over 8. So, what I get is that this is some E not prime is essentially E not. So, um, what was E not? E was E not was a set of C's for which the Fourier transform is bigger than some delta. Now, we add numbers, complex numbers, which are in absolute value bigger than delta. I could get cancellations. I don't want that. So I restrict the Fourier of Fourier only those Fourier only those indices for which the Fourier transform lies in some fixed. Uh, cone where I don't have cancellation. Okay, so it's essentially minor nuisance, but it's not a material difference. So this sort of says that there are many pairs. If you figure out this particular set, there are many, there are many uh, C, or let's say even quantitatively. So there is at least at least uh, delta over 8, delta squared over 8, size of E prime 0 squared, pairs C and C prime inside this uh, set such that C minus C prime is inside E1. And uh, what Balog, so now the magic is that somehow um, what Balog, Semeredi, and uh, Gowers give, which is this kind of ingredient is absolutely essential in all of these. Um, So what Balog, uh, Semredi, and Gauss give is, in fact, there is some set uh, A in um, if E1 was not much bigger than E0, 
there would be some set A inside E0, or E0 prime if you wish. A would be big, would be bigger than some P to the minus C epsilon delta to the C epsilon uh, size of E1, and uh, A minus A would be smaller than uh, essentially uh, something of the same form. So now um, my uh, some product facts my some product fact told me that for any set A whatsoever the number of uh, C such that A plus CA is less than A uh, to the one some kind of average between A and P something which is essentially, if A is not too big, A size of A times some uh, power of P is uh, small. Now in general, this is all you could say, but if A is, uh, if A minus A is small, you again, you again call uh, Professor Ruja to the rescue, um, you could actually get that uh, there would be, uh, there can't be many Xs, so you could bound this A plus Xa, you could bound by A. Um, Yeah, maybe minus, it's not so, pluses and minuses of here are not, uh, there's a version of the Rosa inequality with plus, with all pluses, so let me, it's harder to prove, but let's ignore it for a moment. Um, so I have here CA intersection A, that's a general sort of stupid inequality. Messing up the sign. So this is uh, less than in each one of these. I have intersections. So this is less than a minus a, and this is less than c a minus c a. So it's less than a minus a squared over the size of c a intersection a. So if a minus a is small, I know that the number of c's such that A intersection CA is large is small. And now, if you sort of um, work out the definition of E2, and now E2 is related to E1, and um, which is a nice calculation, you could actually easily deduce from that that uh, assuming that E1 was not much bigger than E0, then E2 has to be much bigger than E1. And that uh, finishes the proof of this main lemma. This main lemma um, allows you to do this bootstrapping to get from the weak information something stronger. 
And then using this book stopping, you get the bound of the Fourier coefficient, which gives you the equidistribution of the random walk. So, okay, I mean, it's a non trivial theorem. I gave you essentially a full proof. So, a little bit condensed, but uh, I hope something survived. Thank you.